Thank you. I got a quick video to show y'all before I get started, if that's okay. <laughs> 1.1 billion people in the world don't have access to clean water. My efforts are going to be a drop in the bucket. But if I had never taken that step because it was too big of a problem, then we wouldn't be anywhere right now. In December of 2003 is when the idea came for the organization Wine to Water. We're very involved with water filtration around the world. When we take the water from the street and we put it in here, the water that's in the bottom is not going to be making you feel sick to your stomach anymore. February of last year, I get a phone call from someone in the CNN Heroes Department saying that I've been nominated, which was completely shocking. From Boone, North Carolina, meet Doc Henley. Through his Wine to Water program, this bartender provides clean, sustainable water to thousands worldwide. This ceiling that we were kept hitting over and over, that we can only tell this amount of people about this water crisis, was just completely shattered. Everything from when you're nominated uh, to getting through the top ten to being in the Kodak Theater could not have made me and everybody that was around me feel more special. But I'm very proud to be a part of this group. For many, trapped in the rubble of downtown Port-au-Prince, the struggle to live continues. The earthquake happened in Haiti. Immediately, I went down there and to figure out where I could be plugged in. She can't get well. She doesn't have anything to drink. Obviously, you can see it's something that is that I'm very passionate about now. Um, oh, sorry, I didn't, yeah. yeah. In five years, my goal is to have reached a million people for clean water. If you find something you're passionate about, I don't care who you are, you will make a difference. My name is Doc Kinley. I'm a 2009 CNN hero. I started the organization Wine to Water. All right, so I actually got to be honest and say it's, it's, it's actually really difficult to follow that video. I sometimes even wonder whether I should show it or not, but uh, it, it's hard to follow that because CNN's job of making that video was to try to make me look as squeaky clean and perfect as possible, and that's about as far from who I really am as you can get. I'm, I'm one of the more imperfect and average, um, maybe even below average people that you'll ever meet in your entire life. Um, so it's hard to follow that. But I, I think before I even tell you about the work that we're doing with Wine to Water, I think it's important that you know a little bit about my background and, and, and where I come from. Uh, I come from a family, I kind of grew up in, in both the Carolinas and South and North Carolina. And uh, in my family, it was really strange. I felt like everybody that was around me was about as perfect and as exceptional as they could come, um, minus me, of course. But if you, uh, if you take, in my family, there was like three kind of measures of success that you could kind of get the pat on the back from my daddy or my granddaddy or, or somebody in my family. Um, and number one uh, in my family was, uh, was sports. Like athletics was a really big deal uh, to us because we came from a lot of really serious level athletes. Just to give you an idea, I was named after my grandfather uh, who played professional football for the Steelers uh, right up the road here. Um, so he, he was pretty good. Um, and so I was passionate about football. I've been passionate about the Steelers my whole life. I'm like, I want to play like he played. But I realized that not only would I never make it to the NFL, I w probably wouldn't even make it actually out on the high school field because my rear end never really left the bench and you need to actually be on the field to accomplish great things. So I didn't do so well in football. I, I actually developed a little slower uh, than a lot of my friends did. So I was a lot smaller and uh, not quite as strong as everybody else my age. So then I switched sports and I started playing basketball. And I thought, no joke, I, I'm, I'm really doing pretty good. I'm playing on a few competitive teams. My confidence is starting to build up. So I'm thinking, well, maybe, maybe as I get a little older, I get to high school, I can start playing basketball. But then something happened. Uh, my younger brother, um, by almost five years, he turned out to be six foot nine. Um, so if you can imagine what it was like, you know, I'm, I'm 14, 15, getting excited and getting, getting dunked on in the backyard by my, by my 10 year old brother. It's not real good for my confidence. So I switched from basketball and I'm like, okay, what about golf? For God's sake. So it's a stick and a ball. Nobody's chasing me here. Like I can do this. I can play golf. So I started playing golf and I entered some tournaments uh, and I started growing up playing with my cousin. 
my granddaddy, who was the football player, was also a, a really good golfer, and so he was teaching me and my cousin how to play golf. And I noticed something when I would enter these tournaments, my cousin's name was always like one or two off the top of the leaderboard. And unfortunately, mom was always like one or two off the bottom of the leaderboard. And uh, so I hung up the golf clubs. And of course, my cousin went on to play. Uh, he, he's on the PGA Tour right now. Uh, he won the U.S. Open just a few years ago. His name is Lucas Glover. Like he's playing this weekend in whatever big tournament is there this weekend. And so, you know, I didn't, I didn't make it in sports. Um, so then I shifted to number two in my family was academics. That was really important. How good are you at learning and stuff? And that one didn't work out too well for me either. Because um, I, I wasn't like my sister. I, I, could, I could just, I was in awe as I watched her grow. Uh, you know, she could sit in the classroom and just, just listen to all the words the teacher was saying, and they would just stick in there. She could remember them all and then put them on a test. And no joke, she only made one B in her whole scholastic career. Like, she was top of the class. She had all these, when she graduated, all these different colored things hanging around her neck and, like, really important. She went on to be a, a graduate student, and then even, I think, further past that, I think it even... She was in school for a really long time. Um, but for me, I, 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 when I made a B, like when she made that one B in her whole scholastic career, she literally cried. I saw her. It was a disaster. If I made a B, I would also literally cry, but it was like a totally different reason for the tears. Like I wasn't, <laughs> I didn't see a lot of those Bs, so they were like tears of joy. Um, I, I learned later in life, I just thought that I was stupid growing up, but I, just, I learned later that... I, I can't, I can't just sit at a desk and have some teacher preach at me all week and I can remember all that and put it on a test. Like, I have to, I have to see it and touch it and feel it before I can really understand it. Um, but I didn't know that until much later after school. So I grew up just thinking I'm not good enough in the athletic world, I'm not good enough in the scholastic world. And the third one in my family, which really is actually the most important to them, was on the spiritual side. My daddy was a, um, was a preacher man when I was growing up. And, you know, I didn't really understand that whole world, um, especially then. I, th I think in my view, in my mind, the, that whole world just meant to me that I had to learn how to follow a lot of rules and regulations. And unfortunately, I think the one thing in my life that I was really good at, actually, was was breaking rules like that was like the one thing I could do really well so unfortunately that didn't go over so well with a daddy who was a preacher man because the one thing I could do is actually um, break a lot of rules and, and do that do that very uniquely um, so I, I, I grew up butting heads with my father uh, quite a bit and not and um, not seeing eye to eye on a lot of things um, and so I got to a point where I'm I'm not too far out of high school, and I've gotten so frustrated just with life in general there in the Carolinas that I just wanted to be as far away from that whole world as I could get, of always having to measure up to my siblings or always having to measure up to my cousins or my friends and constantly coming short. Um, so I took off on my motorcycle. I'm a pretty avid motorcycle rider. I took off, and I actually landed... Uh, for a while out in Montana. I have family out there, and, um, and I had this dream that I would just melt away into the mountains of Montana and just be a cowboy. Um, I remember like the old Marlboro Man commercials when I was little, and I, I wanted to be the Marlboro Man and just go out and just be by myself alone, working the range. And um, so I did. I got a job actually uh, working on a horse ranch out there. Unfortunately, it wasn't quite like the old Western movies or like the Marlboro Man billboards, like I, I spent about 90% of my time shoveling horse manure. Um, and uh, I actually, it, it didn't pay very well. So I had to live in a barn most of that year. I lived in the barn with the horses that I worked with. Um, so it wasn't quite as glorious as I had hoped it would be, but something really important happened to me when I was there. And I think, I guess I was about 18, 19 years old at this time. And for most of my life, I felt like the world around me was just screaming at me about how I wasn't good enough. How I wasn't like everybody else. I'm not like my sister. I'm not like my brothers. I'm not like my dad. I'm not like 
these people. And I feel like when I was there, because I had so much time by myself and alone, that that voice just kind of just went away. And I think it was there with the first time I ever just started to listen to something that I couldn't really make out very well, but it was much deeper inside of me that, that was, I could feel it, that it was more encouraging and that it, it urged me not to give up on life and urged me forward like there, there is something for me out there. I, I am not a complete lost cause. Um, but I also heard something else. It was my mama on the phone screaming at me constantly trying to get me to come back to the East Coast and trying to get me to go back to school. And so finally I gave in and I started going uh, to school at North Carolina State University. I had to go to community college first to get my grades up a little bit to where I could be accepted. And so I finally got accepted to North Carolina State in Raleigh. And as I'm working my way through school, I found a job that I actually really fell in love with. I started out as a server, just serving people their food. You know, and I actually really loved that job. One, it was way better money than what I was making back working on the horse ranch. But not only that, but I actually loved the interaction that I got to have with people every day. I loved being the guy that, like, if I did my job right, let's say people were coming in on Sunday after church and they're sitting together as a family meal and I got to serve them their food. If I did my job well, I really, I actually could have an impact on their day, a, a positive impact. And if I'm happy and having a good conversation, they could walk out of my restaurant like with a smile, like just because of my job that I'm getting paid for. So I started to really love the restaurant industry. And then a few years go by and I got thrown behind the bar to be a bartender. And no joke, when I got to be a bartender, like I thought that I had arrived at life. Like this is, this is the epitome that life has to offer a guy like me. Because now I'm making even more money than I was serving. But even then, that's not really why I fell in love with being a bartender. I love being a bartender because I know I could sit at my bar and it's, it was an old Irish pub that I, was my last place I worked in. And I'd sit there at happy hour and there'd be like, the CEO of some company sitting here in his white collar, you know, sitting next to a school teacher, next to a stay-at-home mama, next to a construction worker. You know, they were all walks of life there. And none of them were there to, like, sit and measure up to each other. Like, they were all this there to just, just take a deep breath, have a good conversation, forget about their day, talk about the game on TV or whatever. And I think it was maybe one of the first communities that I really felt welcome, that I really just got to be myself. I didn't have to be anybody else. I didn't have to dress different. I didn't have to talk different. I just got to be me. And so I I really was happy of being a bartender. And honestly, I didn't think I was going to do anything else but that. So why am I up here and not back at the bar? Um, I don't really know. I don't really know why things happen the way they do, but I, I can remember exactly when it all started to change for me. I was telling a group earlier today that I got to hang out with um, that asked me kind of what was the moment that it all started. And I remember it was like, this was December of 2003. I also play a little bit of music at the bar that I work in, and I'm not even really a, that great of a musician, but I uh, but that's why I choose to sing like Merle Haggard and Johnny Cash and like old country songs. Because, you know, you don't have to be an amazing American Idol singer to sing Johnny Cash, for goodness sakes. You know, I could wake up in the morning with a cold and sound better singing Johnny Cash. So I just got done singing a gig. I'm sitting at the bar and my best friend in the whole world at the time, uh, her name is Tasha Sullivan. We're very, very close. I really looked up to her because... Um, not only was she a bartender in town, but she somehow found time in her week and she volunteered at the local hospital there in Raleigh and she would visit young girls who had gone through really like traumatic experiences like uh, sexual assault and rape and different things like that because uh, she had a pretty difficult background and, and, uh, and so she would give of herself to pour into these people, not as a job, but just because that's what she loved to do. So I really respected her and I really looked up to her and I remember she sits down this one night and she looks over at me and she's like, is this it? Is this really it for you? I had about one semester left before I was gonna graduate and she's like, you're gonna get a degree and, but you're not going anywhere with it, are you? You're gonna stay right here and keep bartending. And I'm like, 
Absolutely. I'm not going anywhere. I'm staying right here. I'm playing my guitar. I'll be behind the bar and that's it. And she didn't laugh or smile or nothing. She just looked back and she's like, that's a shame. You know, because you have more to offer this world than what you're offering it right now. You know, and I don't think we said much after that. She just, we just kind of sat there and she paid for a drink and she walked out. And I remember sitting there by myself just playing over the words that she said and just kind of, it really kind of messed me up. And, and I had a couple weeks off of school because it's December, so I had Christmas break off of school. So I remember I went to my boss and I'm like, you know, can I just have a couple weeks off and just to go home and visit my family for Christmas? And he's like, absolutely. So I took some time off. My parents had moved to a little town where I live now, uh, up in the mountains of North Carolina. So I went to visit them just to kind of get away. And in the middle of the night, one night, I was kind of half asleep, half awake. I had this phrase that you see on the screen there. I had wine to water, and it was just stuck in my head over and over, like a, like a broken record, like wine to water, wine to water, you know. So I kept thinking about it, and I kind of woke up or whatever, and and. I first thought, you know, I actually like to write my own music, even though I didn't really play it out for anybody. Um, so I keep a pad and pen near my bed so I can write stuff. So I grabbed the pad and the pen, and I first started thinking, well, may, wait a minute, this, is, this could actually be a really cool idea for a really cool country song. You know, like maybe that's what my friend Tasha was talking about. Maybe she saw in me the ability to be a great singer, songwriter, country music star, you know. So, you know, my favorite miracle that my daddy told me about growing up was with the words the other way around, the water to wine story. And I, there was a lot of thing about scripture that I didn't understand, but there were some things that just spoke to me, I feel like. And that story is one of those things. I loved the story that you've got the God of the universe comes here in the flesh and out of all the miracles he could have chosen to do, out of all of them, whether it's feeding thousands of people, whether it's healing people of their ailments, whether it's raising people from the dead, he started his ministry off because a wedding party had ran out of wine. And to me, the reason why that always spoke to me was because I, I feel like we put God so far away because he is so big and he is so powerful that we think maybe he doesn't really care about the little things. And he does. And if it's from raising somebody from the dead or from healing somebody or if it's something as simple as a really important day for a couple, one of the most important days of their life, they're getting married and they ran out of wine and they wanted the party to continue to celebrate, he cared about those things. And so to me, that always spoke to me. So I'm like, all right, with it turned around, you know, wine to water, I can make a really cool country song out of this. So I'm like, wine to water. And before I could even start to think of what I, else I wanted to write, right when I saw the words written on the page, I remember, like, I felt, I don't know, I felt this real strange feeling in my stomach, like this real nervous feeling. And I couldn't write anymore. I just knew, I knew it was supposed to be something different, that it wasn't supposed to be a song. Um, so I went down to my parents' computer, and I just started pulling up Google and started researching, and I just, I had three words to go on, and I deal with wine every single day at my job, you know, so I was like, well, I'm not going to look up anything about wine, but what about water? Maybe there's something I need to know. And I typed in there, I don't know, something like water issues or water problems, <clears throat> And what filled that screen up on that computer is what, is what changed the course of my life. You know, I remember the first thing I read said that over a billion people, 1.1 billion people on the planet lack access to safe drinking water. And I remember sitting thinking like, that doesn't even make sense because I'm, I'm not real good with like geology or geography, geography, where like with the amount of people in the world and the places, I'm not good with that. But I'm pretty sure there's only like six or seven billion people in the world. And if over one of those billion doesn't have access to safe water, that, that's a huge number. So how come I've not heard about this by now? You know, so I keep reading, I keep digging, I can't sleep now. And then I remember reading a report from the WHO, the World Health Organization, saying that more young kids won't reach their fifth birthday, won't make it to the age of five because of water-related illnesses. 
diarrheal disease being the leading number one cause of death in the world still today. And, I, and then it listed the next three. HIV AIDS was number two. I'd heard all about that. My favorite musicians and bands did the big red campaigns with the ribbons and they raised all this money for HIV AIDS and that was number two. I remember learning about malaria and that's number three and how devastating it is around the world, how devastating it was like in Vietnam. I learned in the school that, you know, that, that, that peop more people were felled by malaria in the Vietnam more than bullets. That's number three. Number four at the time was tuberculosis. Now it's measles. But water kills more than all those combined, combined together. But especially at this time, I didn't hear anything about it. I didn't know nothing about it. So I remember the next morning, I still hadn't slept. I'm kind of excited. I called my friend Tasha, and I'm like, I got an idea. I need your help with it. I, I want to do this thing. We're going to call it a wine to water event. We're going to host it at one of the bars, and we're going to invite people. And I bet we can get free wine donated from the different distributors. So we'll do a really fun wine tasting. And I bet we can get some free food from the places that you and I have worked. And, and you know what? I'd be willing to offer my musical abilities all pro bono for the event, free of charge, you know. So next thing I know, like February 2004, we had the first Wine to Water event. It didn't cost us anything. And we had about 300 people show up. We raised like $5,000, five or 6000 that night. And I'm counting the money. And I'm kind of freaking out because I've never seen that much money like in front of me before like that. And then while we're counting money, there's another uh, restaurant owner that came up to me. He's like, Doc, this is awesome. Can we do this wine to water thing at my place? And I'm like, well, yeah, we can do another one. So like a month later, we did another one, raised another four or $5,000. I opened a P.O. box and I opened a bank account. And, and people just started sending in money when they heard about what we were doing. And I kind of started freaking out even more because I would look at this account and it literally started to accumulate like tens of thousands of dollars in it, you know. <clears throat> and I've got no clue uh, how to get it to turn into this stuff to these people. I, I have no clue. In fact, I even looked back not too long after that thinking maybe even I was doing something illegal because I didn't even have any charity status or nothing. I just started taking people's money, you know. Um, but one of the first people that we brought on was uh, um, on the board was a CPA who was really good with that kind of stuff, and she helped me make sure I wasn't breaking any laws or anything like that. So we're good. But how did I take that money and turn it into this? And so after a lot of thought and consideration, I was like, you know, I'd love to get to be the guy that travels the world and, like, helps these people myself, but I don't know what I'm doing. You know, I guess I can raise the money, and, I, you know, I love being a bartender, so I'm just going to keep doing those two things, and I'm going to find an already established organization, give them the money, and just let them do what they do already. So I did a ton of research. I found a lot of organizations that really caught my eye, but there was one based also right out of North Carolina Huge organization that does a lot of different types of work around the world with food, medical, education, all this stuff. But they had a really big water sector. Some of y'all may have heard of uh, the group. It's uh, Billy Graham's uh, son uh, runs that, uh, Franklin Graham. The organization is called Samaritan's Purse. Uh, they're based also out of North Carolina. So uh, I heard a lot of good things and read a lot of good things. I found out that over 90 plus percent of their money that's given to them actually goes to the people that need it. So I thought that was really cool because I worked really hard to raise this money and I didn't want it just to go to somebody's personal jet, you know. And so I went and got a meeting and my whole thought in getting a meeting where somehow I, I was able to meet with the head of all their international operations, well, I just wanted to talk to him and make sure if I give you this money, I'm really passionate about water. Can you promise me it's going to go to water? So I sat in this meeting and I grilled this guy for a while, asking him all these questions and he was very patient and very kind to let me do that. And then he kind of turned it around on me, and he's like, can I ask you a few questions? I'm like, yes, sir. He said, why are you doing this? And I'm like, oh, well, maybe I didn't, you know, explain. You know, I had this really weird dream this one night, and I started thinking about this concept of wine to water, and, you know, now I'm really passionate about water. I kind of fumbled through it. And he's like, okay, that, that's awesome, but are you wanting this to be your job? You know, are you, are you taking any of that money for yourself, you know, for your time and your energy? And I was like, well, well no, sir. I got a good job. I'm a bartender. I don't need another job. He said, well, let me ask you again then. Why, why would you do this? You know, I don't, 
I don't know if I ever came up with a good answer for him. And I'm not even sure if I can think of a good answer now. I just, I think I said something like, you know, I think for the first time in my life, I feel like I'm doing what I'm supposed to do. Most of my life before this has just been one disaster after another. So if it's okay, if you'll just take the money that I've been raising and promise me it's going to go to these people, I'll go back to my bar and I'll keep raising money. And every month or two, I'll just bring you a check and, we'll, you know, that'll be good. And he kind of looked at me and he's like, I'll tell you what, I got a better idea. How about you go back to your bar and how about you put in your two-week notice and how about you come work for me? Um, why don't you let me send you to any one of the programs that we work at around the world that have to do with water? Because um, I think you need, it's important for you to see what's happening. I think you're onto something. I think your wine to water idea that you've had, I think it really has the opportunity to help a lot of people. But you really need to see it for yourself in the field. Then you can take the two things that you've got and put them together. The ability to raise the money and reach people here and the ability to actually see what it's like in the field. You can put those two together. So he said, you know, where, where do you think you, would you like to go? On a map, on a wall, he had this big map. And I remember looking at it, and I was really overwhelmed because um, I, I didn't understand anything about that, <laughs> where, the different places, where the needs were, whatever. And, um, and so he's like, you know, what are you, what are you thinking? I'm like, well, just, you know what, just send me to the worst place on that map that you guys are working, the worst place. They had all these little pins all over the map. And he's like, the worst place. I'm like, the worst place. And a lot of people think when I said that I was being brave or courageous, and that's not the case. What I was actually thinking is if I've never really been that confident in myself or ever really viewed myself as the most intelligent person in the world, well, gosh, even if you put me in the most god-awful place on the planet, I'm pretty sure I can't screw that place up any worse than it already is. And I'm pretty sure I make it even do a pretty good job there. You know? <laughs> so he said, he's like, all right, well, I'll tell you right now, it's going to be between Afghanistan, which this is 2004. We're in the middle of a war. There's a major water crisis going on there. And he's like, we'll have a team of people that can meet you and help you learn what you need to do. But there's this other place right now that's getting really bad in the western region of Sudan. It's called Darfur. And for years, there's been like a civil war happening there. But now that civil war has turned into a genocide where the government of Sudan is systematically extinguishing the population of Darfur because of, of the color of their skin. And they're using water in a lot of places to do it. They're shooting up the wells. They're polluting the water sources. And um, so not only is a civil war turning into a genocide, it's in sub-Saharan Africa. So sometimes temperatures are going to get to be where it's like 115 120 degrees. Sometimes they even go higher than that. Um, and on top of that, it's such a new, really bad crisis that we don't have anybody there right now. You'll be one of the first people on the ground, and you're just going to kind of have to figure it out. So I was like, okay, war, genocide, desert, alone. Okay, I guess that's the worst place in the world. You can send me to Darfur. So this is now six months after my very first event in Raleigh, um, this would be like August of 2004, I was on a plane to this place here. This was the very first camp that I worked in, uh, or it was a village that turned into like a refugee type camp. Um, and there was about 10,000 people, eight to 10,000 people in this place called Marla. And this is one of the first places I worked, and I remember. I had a little point-and-shoot camera with me, and I snapped this picture because I'm like, all right, these, these women and kids are off to get their water. You know, where are they going? So I snap a picture, and I start to walk with them, and literally like, like two hours plus later or whatever it was, we get to where their water hole is, this nasty hole in the ground with this muddy water you can see by their buckets. I mean, it, it's not a good situation. And they get that water, and then the big ones that are five gallons, water weighs about eight pounds a gallon, so that's like 40 pounds then they're carrying those back to their little tents back there. Um, so they spend most of their day doing that. And then come to find out, obviously it didn't take much uh, research and digging to find out the biggest reason why the kids were sick and unfortunately dying in the camp was from really bad stomach diarrheal disease and dehydration from the diarrheal disease that came from drinking water that looked more like chocolate milk. 
Um, and so we put a water system in for this, for this refugee camp, for this village, and it wasn't the most sustainable in the beginning. I just needed to fix it fast until I could figure out a more long-term solution. That's kind of how I work in my life. I don't always use my brain first. Sometimes I just do first, and then I think about it later. So the, the idea was to let's find the nearest clean water well we can find. I couldn't afford to put a new well in. If you have your own drilling machine, which they cost like hundred, two hundred thousand dollars to have, if you have one, they still cost you, you know, six, seven thousand dollars, give or take, to drill each well. But if you don't, if you're going to partner with another organization, you may have to pay more than that, eight to ten thousand dollars per well. I didn't have that kind of money, and I didn't know what to do, but I just knew we had to do something. So we put a big water tank in. I found the nearest clean water well that I could find. And I found a guy locally that had a truck, and we put a big water tank on the back of the truck, and I had him every single day drive water until we filled that, this thing up, the water tank up, until I could figure something else out. And it's crazy, like the entire community immediately began to change when they got clean water. If you think about it, I never really thought about it until I saw it firsthand, but for us, we don't think about it because we just get up in the morning, we go hop in the shower, we stand there for like 20 minutes and we hop out and we go brush our teeth and we leave the water on and it's just there. But for them, the most of their life having to walk four or five hours to get it, the second they have it just three, four minutes away, it changes everything. So now you got these women who are able to be more productive. They're going out and gathering firewood. They're making things to sell in the market. They're being more productive and figuring out ways to bring in more income for their little community. And the kids have free time on their hands, so I started to learn what it meant to partner with other organizations. Another guy I was working with was really passionate about education. So together we were able to put a school there, and he found a teacher. And so next thing you know, we've got kids going to school. And there it was really taboo for the girls to go to school with the boys because it's a really like um, um, conservative Islamic area. But we were able to partner with another person that was doing the feeding programs. So we did a feeding program in the school. So the parents were like, all right, well, our our daughters are going to get fed. So let's let them go to school. So we got little girls and little boys getting education together, getting fed healthy from drinking clean water. The mothers are being more productive. There's income coming in. And the entire community just begins to change immediately because they have access to something that we forget about every single day of our life. I was getting super excited. I actually finally found an organization that was willing to come drill a well for us without us having to pay for it. Um, It was in their mandate to put a certain amount out in Darfur. And so I was super excited. And just before the drilling machine left to go dig that well in Mala Camp, the government of Sudan came in with their helicopter gunships and they bombed the camp there and they killed a lot of the, the people that I had gotten to know and, and to love. And um, they found the driver of my truck. And uh, they beat him severely, almost to death. Uh, they took our water system that we had there and they shot it up with their machine guns. Uh, and so that's kind of when I knew that you know, maybe this wasn't going to be, be as, quite as easy as I had hoped it to be or anticipated it to be. Um, from there, I actually went to another community not too far away. And I had the idea that, you know, if people for thousands of years have been digging wells by hand, we can do this. I've got some local people that said they knew what they were doing, and I got some materials, some shovels, and some picks. And I found an area that a local person that supposedly knew about water was like, there's water right there. We can dig it. So we dug for weeks to try to dig this really big hand-dug well, and it was a disaster. We never hit water. Um, I was getting really frustrated. And in the same place of Rajela um, is where I really started to meet um, these guys here. Uh, this, act, this group back right here is actually the, the Joint Equality Movement, the JEM, which was one of the rebel groups. And I remember um, they're kind of scary looking. Uh, and a lot of people, you can look at them as the good guys because they're actually fighting against the government to protect their people. Um, the problem is, is they've actually kidnapped and sometimes even killed humanitarian aid workers if they just if they don't trust you or they think you're a spy from the government they can you know do whatever they want because there's not really any law. Um, but I started watching how a lot of the organizations worked, where they were very afraid of the areas that these guys had control of, 
Um, and so they would get near a rebel-controlled area. Let's say it's a food organization. They go there, and a lot of times they do this big distribution, and they get food off the back of the truck as quick as they could. And as the sun's going down, if it's getting too late, whether they're finished or not, they're out of there. Get back to their, you know, the safe air conditioned compound or whatever. Uh, or, or let's say it's a well drilling group, they get out and they'd start digging wells or doing water work or whatever. And if they're near these areas, the sun's going down, same thing, they're out of there. So I started to look and be like, well, of course these, these guys don't trust us, you know, or don't know if they can trust us. Because it seems like nobody's ever taken that initiative or not yet to build a relationship with them. You know, I, I honestly, I didn't know much about humanitarian work. Obviously, I was a disaster at it. Um, but the one thing as a bartender that I loved about my job was the ability to build relationships with people on the other end of the bar, whether they were like me or not like me. And the reason why I fell in love with my job was because I love being the guy behind the bar where, like, if there's awesome stuff going on in your life and you're getting ready to get a raise or a promotion or you're getting ready to get married and you're having a bachelor party or a bachelorette party, like people would come to me and celebrate life and have fun. Or if it's the opposite, things aren't going well. Their jobs, they just lost their job. Their marriage is falling apart. They just lost a loved one. They would come to me with those things and talk with me about those things. And I loved getting to be that guy, to have that conversation with him, whether it's good or bad. So the one thing I loved about my job beforehand that was the ability every single day to build relationships with people, whether it's a different background than me or not. And so I felt like maybe I could do the same thing here in this, in this type of situation. So when I found this group of rebels, um, I remember talking with the guy two to the left of me, it was me and my translator, and I kind of went straight up to him, one of the first conversations I had with him, and I kind of stuck up my hand, and I'm like, you know, I'm really trying to learn Arabic uh, just because I think communication is one of the biggest things in building, a, in building a relationship. So I set my hand out, and I say something like, you know, salam alaikum, alhamdulillah, and I'm going through some of these, you know, greetings and traditional greetings, and then my translator hurries over really quickly to make sure that I don't say anything that gets us, gets us both killed. Um, and then so through my translator, I'm just kind of talking with him, and I'm like, you know, I'm here. Uh, I actually not long before just realized that the well that we were digging is a disaster. I'm like, I really want to help. And if it's okay, I don't know where you're going tonight. I'd love to stay or go with you and wherever you're at and just stay for a few days and not go anywhere and talk to you guys about the work that, that I would like to do. And if you've got any ideas, I'd love to hear them. I'd love to hear your ideas about how we can help you with water. So I'm just trying to communicate with him. And he sees me making an effort. And he sees all his guys and all their guns. And me and my little translator, no guns. And he's like, nam, nam, shukran, jizera. You know, yes, yes, thank you very much. So next thing I know, we're going through the desert. And we're following these guys in their trucks and their machine guns. We get to their little village. And then not long after that, um, they're slaughtering a goat and kind of celebrating that we're there. Um, and, and just, I remember sitting around eating goat, you know, and just talking to him. We're having a conversation about water, and he's like, you know, there's people that have come, and they put wells in for us for years. Even before the war, there's wells all over, but a lot of them are just broken. We have one right here that's not working, and I'm like, wait, you have a well right here in this village. He's like, yeah, it's just right outside our little village here, like right here, and it's been broken for years. We don't know what's going on with it. And so I'm like, let's see it. I want to see it in the morning. So the next day we went up, he showed it to me, and he's like, you know, can you fix this well? And again, sometimes I just say things or do things before I think. So I was like, absolutely, I can fix this well. Totally, we got this. I'm on it. And so I'm like, I'll be right back. I'm going to go back to this village that I'm, that I'm staying at. I'm going to get some supplies, and I'm going to fix it. And as I'm driving away, I'm like, why did you even say that? I don't even know if I can fix a well. I've never fixed a well before, you know? And so um, I remember going back to our main kind of place that we were based at of Niala, gathering a team of men, kind of forming a, a group of water workers because I realized I didn't know what I was doing. But maybe if I got people that knew how to work on those wells, we'd make it work. So we've, we, we formed a team of people. And we got supplies and, and materials. And, um, and I went back and... and um, if we have time, I'll tell you his story, actually. Uh, 
his name is Mustafa. Um, he's 12 years old when I, when I took this picture, and he started fighting at the age of nine, I believe, is when he started. But anyway, I went back um, to there, and I began working on this well. And thank goodness, as we're pulling the guts out of it, you could see, like, water started gushing out. So I knew that there was water there because that's one thing I can't fix. I knew that if it was dry, like, the water just went away. Like, I can't make it appear. So there was water there. We looked at the parts and the pumps, and there's some parts that are corroded. And it took us about a half a day, and we kind of fixed a few of those parts and maybe $40, $50 in materials. We put it back in there, start pumping it before the day was over, and this crystal clear, clean water comes out of that well. And it cost us like next to nothing in comparison to what a new well would cost. So I got super excited. I'm like, can you tell me where more of these wells are? So for, for weeks and weeks, me and my guys would travel all around the desert, fix some wells. And he picked up that thing that was hanging around his neck was a satellite phone. So he could call other commanders and he called this other commander. He's like, yeah, I'm going to send you this guy. He's going to help fix all the wells in your area. And you don't want to shoot him when he comes there. He's an American guy, but just take care of him because um, he really can help to fix these wells. So he sent me to another area called Jebel Mara, which is like a mountainous region there uh, that the rebels had a stronghold in. So we're fixing wells all throughout Darfur. And then it kind of hits me one day when I'm like, this isn't going to work because I'm still just coming here as a Westerner and just fixing these people's problems for them. But I think we maybe can still make it, make it work, but instead of me being the one to fix it, or even my team of guys, what if we were to bring extra toolkits, kits, extra supplies and materials, and what if we could form like a little water committee there locally, and we can begin to teach the locals how to fix their own wells, how to te teach them how to access their own water instead of always waiting on someone to come solve their problems for them. Like, wouldn't that make more sense? So I got really excited, and when I started watching how it would change and empower a community when you taught them how to fix their own problems, that's really when I got excited. I'm like, I want to come back to the States. I want to come back home, and I want my organization to be built on the concept of the whole age-old saying of, you know, you can give a man a fish forever, but if you teach a man to fish, it'll last his whole life, you know, so let's teach a man to fish that concept. Unfortunately, there were some difficult things uh, that happened to me in Darfur that made it a little bit harder for me to be excited. Um, when I was coming back from that one area called Jebel Mara, the mountainous area, I was coming back from there to, um, to the area where I was based at in Niala, and um, on one of my trips back through, um, we had a little bit of an incident where when I was coming back through, there was a, the, the bad guys that were doing all the killing who the government hired and basically paid and, and funded to do all the killing in Darfur were, were called the Janjaweed, which in the local language means the, the evil horsemen. Um, and the Janjaweed were a nomadic tribe. So there's one area where you had to drive through where they had their horses and camels, and you rarely saw them. I only saw them once before, and they actually did get my guys. They shot their gun out in the road and stopped our vehicles. They pulled our men out. They smashed one of the guys in the head with the gun, and they, they you know, threatened to kill us. Um, but we were able to get free that time. And I hadn't seen them since, but I'm coming through this area again, and I start to see horses and camels up on the hill, which is not a good sign in this area, so my heart's kind of pounding, and I get closer and closer, and I see a couple guys on either side of the road, like, with their machine guns, and they were hidden, like, behind these trees and rocks, which was different, too, because the last time I saw them, they jumped in the road, and they shot off their guns, so I'm like, well, what do I do? What, what do I do? Do I stop and talk to them? Do I just floor it and go? And, you know, I couldn't really figure it out. And so my foot did all the thinking for me. I remember I was in the lead vehicle and I had a truck right behind me with the supplies. I had my, the window down and my arm out and I just felt my foot like hit the gas and I'm like, all right, we're going to go. That's what we're going to do. You know, so I hit the gas and then the right at like that same second, the truck starts to go and there's a guy right here out of the corner of my eye with his gun right on me and he shot and I could feel like the heat or the the blast from that barrel and I guess I don't know where the bullet went I guess it just went right in front of me and then I hear the other guys shooting and it's like 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 popping off and the bullets are whizzing by and they're like smashing through my windows and tearing in the metal and then my guys on the radio behind me are screaming in Arabic you know like like we need to stop we need to stop and I'm 
like trying to scream back in Arabic, like la, 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 humps to the guy, like no, 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 man, like five more minutes. They're trying to tell me they had their tire shot out and uh, they needed to stop. And I'm like, we're not stopping to change your tire in the middle of an ambush. Like we can make it. If we can make it on the rim, you know, so I'm screaming back, like, five more minutes, five more minutes in Arabic. Then we finally made it, like, like five more kilometers away from where we were ambushed. You know, we made it through. And I don't know if you guys watch NASCAR very much up here. We're pretty big NASCAR fans down in North Carolina. And we changed the tire on that vehicle like the most well-oiled pit crew that you have ever seen, you know. And we didn't have one of those, like, whoop, 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 whoop you know, little, little things. Like we had this little tire iron that was like an X and we had that thing off in like 90 seconds changed out. And I'm like, dude, that was awesome. Like we got a, a couple seconds here to look like I wanted to look over the vehicle, make sure it can drive. You guys are good. All right. Let me look at my vehicle. My gas tank uh, was sticking out of the back here. It had been shot with, with a bullet on that vehicle. I had two gas tanks. So I switched to the other one and I'm looking and there's one bullet hole that kind of caught my eye. And I looked at it, and I remember seeing that it looked like it was going right from my head because it had gone in the back window, like, perfectly where my head was. And I had a cardboard box that sat right behind my seat, which had chlorine tablets in the box that we used to kind of treat the water supply. So... I could see where the bullet went in the back of the window, and I could see the straight line where that bullet was headed straight for my head. And I looked at the seat, no bullet hole. I kind of felt real quick. There's nothing I don't know about back there. And then I looked real closer, and on the end of that box, you could see the line where that bullet, just for some reason, at the very end of that box, just took an almost 90-degree turn and just went that way. And I remember, like, kind of looking and looking at the new line, put my finger like this, and sure enough, I could see, like, a little, little teeny hole, and I could look out the window of the truck, and I saw this big bulge of metal where, for some reason, that bullet went straight in, took a turn, and went that way. And to be honest, like, I remember that, that day very fuzzily I don't my adrenaline was pumping a lot but that thing that was vivid to me um but I didn't really process it I don't think my adrenaline was pumping so much even for the weeks later but I look back at that day a lot now my life's taken a thousand different turns since that day but I think that was the first day I can look back on and know for certain that that I am doing what I'm supposed to do. And I know for certain that no matter if there's a difference of views and opinions between my mama and my daddy and me, that every day, every day that I was there, I knew, I knew that they were praying for me. And I believe that that day that those prayers were answered. And so I continue to work. Um, the United Nations was very gracious. They airlifted me in to Jail Bomara, so I didn't have to drive through that area anymore. And so I finished out my time working. Unfortunately, just before coming home, I was still excited, um, but the Janjaweed got a hold of one of my guys uh, not long before I came home, a good friend of mine uh, whose name was Ismail. Um, and my team was made up of half Christians and half Muslims. Um, I don't really know why I did that. I just maybe wanted to see what would happen. Um, but Ismail became a very good friend of mine, and the Janjaweed captured him and executed him. So instead of me leaving and celebrating with my men the year that we had, and you know, we ended up spending our last day or so burying him and mourning his loss, and his family was very gracious. That, um, they brought me to the grave site, and they handed me a shovel, and they taught me how to dig the grave according to their law and their culture. And that was a very honoring thing because I was very open with my men about the things that I believed. Um, but I also was very clear with them that I'm here to do one thing. And I'm here to love you guys and to serve alongside you guys. And that's it. I'm not asking you to become like me. I just want you to know that I love you. 
And that's what we tried to establish together. So for his family to invite me to take part of the burial was a very honoring thing. But it was a very difficult thing because I felt responsible for his death. He was a father. He had kids. At this time, I hadn't, I hadn't nobody but myself. So I remember flying back home across the ocean just kind of, I didn't really know what I was going to do. I came home. I wasn't excited. I wasn't happy. I didn't want to do this anymore. And I, I think I would have given up had I not met my wife. And, um, and I met her back home in a bar, of course. Um, I was just craving, like, good old classic rock and some live music. And I found this place where there was, like, a local Leonard Skinner cover band. And so I found the darkest corner of this place that I could find. And, you know, I'm just sitting, having, like, a, a drink in my hand like this. And you know how sometimes your drink like this can miraculously turn into one of these guys right here? Um, so Freebird comes on. It's like one of my favorite songs. So I'm in the corner by myself being that really weird emo guy who's singing to himself. Um, and I, I'm sitting there like in my, I don't know why, but I was like singing in my real like weird Michael Jackson falsetto voice. Like, I'm as free as a bird. Now. Like being that guy that nobody wants to talk to. And I didn't want to be talked to. But in the middle of the song, I'll turn around and look and the doors of this place like swing open and light shines in from the street. <laughs> and this whole pack of smoking hot girls walks in the bar together. Like an entire pack of them. So I was like, whoa. You know, I've been in the desert for a year, you know. I was like, oh, my goodness. But then I remembered what every bartender, we have like a few rules that bartenders know. And I remembered one of the most important ones is like, if you're alone and you're by yourself and you're a dude, you should never hit on a girl in a pack of girls because they're like a pack of wolves, man. I've seen it numerous times from behind the bar. Like, they will tear you apart. So I was like, whoa. I'm as free. You know, I went right back to sing my song. Like, I knew I had no chance. And no joke, a few minutes later, I get a tap on my shoulder, and I turn around, and it's the smokinest, hottest one, and the entire group had come up to me, and she, like, sticks her hands out, and she, like, says, like, hi, my name's Amber. What's your name? And I was like, okay, you got this. You got this. You got this. <clears throat> Lower the voice. Amber, nice to meet you. My name's Doc. Pleasure to meet you. She's like, oh, okay, so is that your real name? I'm like, yeah, yeah. No, no, but just, just call me Doc. It's nice to meet you. She's like, okay, so you're a doctor. I'm like, absolutely, no, no, it's not like that. It's nice to meet you. My voice is kind of creeping up, you know, because I know the story. It's not a good story. Like, I, I want people to think that it's this cool cowboy, like Doc Holiday kind of thing going on, and that is not the case. So I'm like, just, just call me Doc. And she did one of these, like, what is your real name? And I'm like, lady, I just met you. Why are you demanding my real name? Like, I'm getting nervous and a little sweating. I'm like, okay. I was named after my granddaddy, the guy who played for the Steelers. His name is Dixon. Um, unfortunately, my really smart sister, who's two years older than me at the time, was only two and couldn't pronounce Dixon, so she called me Dick Doc, Okay. So for an ungodly amount of time, my family referred to me as Dick Doc, um, and unfortunately, a few of them still do, um, but somewhere along the way, they, you know, dropped the first part, and they left the second part, and I got stuck with Doc, and, uh, and like, she was laughing by this time hysterically in my face as loud as she could, which later I was to find out is her favorite thing to do in the world is to make fun of me, um, but I'll tell you, I'll tell y'all, it didn't take me long to figure out that the most beautiful thing about her, it's got zero, it's got nothing to do with what I saw on the outside. She had, she had a way about her that on those days that I didn't, I didn't want to do this anymore. I didn't want to do none of this anymore. You know, that voice that I was telling you about earlier would come back and constantly tell me and rem constantly remind me of all the things in my life that I've done wrong and why I don't deserve any of this. And she was that 
that rock for me here in person that didn't let me believe those things. And it took a while, you know, like a year or more just to even pull the pieces back together to where I could even think about doing this work anymore. But thankfully, I was able to continue. Uh, about 2007, we began to grow, and I started working in Ethiopia with this group of guys here, all of them minus the one in the back, grew up in the same orphanage together in Ethiopia. And they made that contraption there, which is a well digging machine made out of some broken down parts of a vehicle. And that thing in my hand is an axle of a vehicle fabricated to kind of pound a hole in the ground until it hits the water table. And then they make a pump out of broken down bicycle parts and pump the water to the surface. So for a fraction of the cost of what, you know, you would spend digging a well with a really big, nice machine, we're able to get really nice, clear running water using all local people and all local materials so that when it breaks, which all wells break, you can fix it with local parts. So from there, we continued our work and we moved over to Cambodia and began working with this machine. We, we couldn't afford, again, the nice machine, so we built this one made out of all local tractor parts and materials. And we dig wells there in, in Cambodia now with our local team and our local machine for about five times less the cost of other organizations. Uh, we're at just under $500 for a well. Uh, for a community, we put a well, water filtration systems, and bathrooms and latrines, all for $500. Whereas other organizations, it costs them about $2,500 just, just to dig the well. <clears throat> so we're... That whole idea of local people, local materials, you know, that concept continued to grow. Um, then we started realizing that it's not just wells. People need the water cleaned. Like, if their water's filthy, they may have plenty of water right, running through a river. But if we could just clean it. So we started working in Uganda with these. These are the first filters we worked in. One of these biosam filters will clean water for 100 people for 10 years. And it costs us about just under $100 to make one, to distribute it, and to teach the people how to use it. So... That's under a dollar per, per like child in, a, in, a, in an orphanage or a school to have water for 10 years. Um, so we went from there, and then as you saw in the video um, in Haiti, we responded to the earthquake there with a, uh, a new style of filter, and that's a ceramic filter, and now we have a factory right in the Dominican Republic. And between the Dominican Republic uh, and Haiti, we've... We're, we're just over like 100,000 water filters, about 30,000 in Haiti after the earthquake, and uh, we're at about 70, 80,000 water filters out of the, the factory there in Dominican. Um, those cost us about $50. Again, local people, local materials doing the work. Um, so the last picture we can go ahead and move to that you just saw. I went on to work in a lot of really difficult areas after even Haiti. I've snuck inside Syria after the war, got started there to deliver water filters to refugees right, that weren't allowed to go over the border into Turkey. I've been to the super typhoon in the Philippines. I've seen some of the worst crises the world has had in the last 10 years or so. And a lot of people, for, you know, they come up, you know, pat you on the back and they'll say, what you're doing is great. All the things you're giving these people and all that you're teaching them. And that's really uncomfortable for me because I don't really view the last 12, 13 years of my life that way. And if I'm honest with you guys and myself, and I look at this picture, this picture represents a lot to me. It's my favorite picture I've ever taken. Because a lot of people in the news or in the media or other organizations, they may, they may like to take a picture of a child with his belly protruding and flies on their face and show you how miserable these people are in this slum or that slum. And sure, you, you see a little bit of that. Like if somebody's really sick or they just got shot or something like that. Like that's, you, you'll see that. But n nine out of ten times, this is what I see. I've been to some of the most devastating places around the world. I actually took this picture. This woman and her daughter lived in one of the worst slums I'd ever seen outside of Kampala, Uganda. And their job was to go to a trash dump and sift through the trash to fight, try to survive. And I snuck around the corner, I had my little camera, and I took this picture. And I fully look at that like I, I believe wholeheartedly that they've given me and they've taught me infinitely more about life than I could ever give or teach them. You know, in this world that we live in right now, there's so much 
that I don't understand. And it's really, really hard for me. I've tried to learn a balance of life to be in places like this and come here. And even more now, I don't understand what's happening. I don't understand what's going on. I don't understand how we can hate somebody because they look different. I don't understand how we can be afraid of somebody because they believe or have a different growing up or a different background or a different culture. I don't understand how it's taken us so far to where if you, all you got to do is turn on one of the news outlets and you would think the entire world was falling apart, and maybe it is. I don't know. But it's like that voice that I kept hearing loud, screaming in my ear, that, that voice of the world. It's not the truth. I promise, promise you guys that all those things that they're telling you is a lie. We were created. We were made to love each other. We were made. We were built very specifically, each one of you very uniquely, to serve and love your brother or your sister sitting next to you, regardless of where they come from, regardless of what they believe, regardless of their background, especially those who aren't like us, especially our enemies. We were made to love and to serve them, not to be afraid of them. And I hope you guys know that I'm so excited and honored to be here. And the more I've gotten to know your, your school and the mission behind your school, years, not a mission that's just started this year or last year, but years and years, decades, if not centuries of, of service and love and extending out a hand to pull somebody up when the rest of the world wasn't willing to, whether it's in the mid-1800s and allowing women to come and study here. I, I can't tell you how much of an honor it is to be here and speak in front of you guys today. And I hope you continue that fight. It's a good fight. It is a great fight to continue. Y'all, God bless you. Thank you for having me. So, yeah, you want to stay right here? Okay. So I think we've got a, a few minutes for some Q&A. I, I went over a little bit, sorry, but I think we've got a few minutes for questions. Um, yeah, you want me to tell you the story? Okay, so Mustafa um, was a child soldier, obviously, you can tell, and uh, I, I took that picture. I, I believe he was 12 years old. My, my brain's getting fuzzy these days, but um, his entire family was, was killed um, by the John Jaweed. Um, and so he made it out, he ran into the desert, and then the rebels, um, he actually was with a different group that, called the SLA, the Sudanese Liberation Army. They came and picked him up and found him and became his family. Um, but they taught him how to fight at an early age. I, I think he was, I guess, eight or nine when he started fighting. Um, and so he was one of the hardest people I'd ever seen. Like, if, if you ever have the chance to be in some of these countries and you see a child soldier, they're different than like the hardened, most hardened one of our special forces soldiers because they learn, they're, they, they're taught things that I don't think any human being should really see, but especially not a child. So his level of hardness was beyond anything I'd ever seen. And my whole mission, when every time I saw him, I'd try to get him to smile. Like I wanted just to get it, like figure out how to get him to smile. And it, it, he just was just hardcore. Um, I don't know if you can pull that picture back up and go back to it. But I remember one day I was passing through there and I had an idea. I'm like, I don't know if it'll work, but children love like gifts, little things. Like, I wonder if I can give them something. But, you know, I, I, I went and I found the market, like especially in this area, they love little trinkets, like little bracelets, little necklaces, especially if it was something done by one of their local cultural people who like it has had something said over it. So then it may ward off bullets or whatever. So I found this really cool uh, necklace and I brought it to him, and I was sitting down with him and trying to struggle through some Arabic. And no joke, he's sitting like in the, in the you know, crook of a tree, this kid, and he's like, like sucking down the last bit of a cigarette, you know. And he looks up at me, and I'm like, I got this for you. And he kind of like looks real like puzzled at me, and I'm like, but I can't give it to you just yet. I, I will give it to you, but I want you to promise me I knew there was some fighting getting ready to go on. I'm like, you gotta promise me you're gonna stay alive. You gotta fight real smart, use your head, stay alive, but it's not free. You have to give me something in return that you think that I would like. 
but if so, if you agree to those terms, then I'll give this to you. And you saw him look at it. He's like, num, num, okay. And he takes it and he looks at this thing and I don't know anything other than a gun or something like that. If he had been given anything like that, maybe except for maybe his mother before. So he had this big smile and he's like, num, num, you know, like, okay. And unfortunately it was right after that that I was ambushed. Um, and his guys were based right on the front lines uh, with the John Jewine. And so after that, like I said, I had to be flown in and dropped off in the mountains with a helicopter and then they come back and pick me up. And so I was never, I was never able to see what happened to him. I'd love, that's probably one of the biggest questions I get to people after reading the book, like, have you gone back? And after all the countries I've been to, we, you know, we worked in over 25 countries. I can go back to every country and check up on every program and get to see all my people. But that's the one where I'm, I'm uh, for some other reasons, um, I'm, you know, the, the government, if, they, if I were to go back there, they, they would, um, they'd put me in jail, so I, I can't go back. So I don't know if he's still alive. I like to think that he is. Um, yeah, but that's, that's Mustafa's story. Yeah. Oh, yes, Arabic's really hard. Um, was it difficult to learn Arabic? Yes. So it's really tough because you can't read it left to right, and even if you could, there's no letters. It's just like lines and dots and stuff. So I had to learn. I always keep a journal with me like to just write down kind of what I'm thinking and what, what's going on in my head. Um, but on that journal, I had a section where I would just write down new words that I was learning. So my goal was to learn how to say, like, how do I say this, like in Arabic, so that I can be like, how do I say this? How do I say this? So I learned that that's deshnu. So deshnu. So I'm, I don't know how to write it in Arabic, but I would write it like the way it sounded in English. So D, for me, it would be like D-E-S-H-I-N-U, deshnu. And so I'd go up and be like, you know, deshnu da, deshnu da. What is this? What is that? And then whatever I would hear, I would write down. And so I came up with pages and pages and pages and lists. And, and so that's what, how I started to learn Arabic. And I got really pretty decent at it until it was time for me to come back. Um, and now Spanish, I'm really trying to learn Spanish really well. And that was a lot easier because there's letters and it's left to right. So I can make it work. I don't have to actually be listening and talking it. I can like, I can get one of those really cool apps, you know, where you like play your friends on the games. Uh, there's, what is one? Uh, Oh man, we were just in one last week that we were playing. It's awesome, but yeah. So Spanish is a little easier for me. So I'm working on both of those right now. So, and just so you guys know, we um we do we, we do have five locations around the world. We love to have volunteers come and help. And no areas where you we're gonna like get you ambushed or shot at or like captured or anything like that. Like we have plenty of very safe areas, like where I brought my family, and they have still a ton of need, a ton of support that is needed in these areas, but our teams love to have volunteers come and dig the wells with them or build the water filters with them. So we have five different locations. If you're interested, you can check out our website, but also we're hoping to have, you know, you can come on your own, like your spring break, your summer, Christmas, whatever, um, but we're looking to do a trip hopefully through the school. And on top of that, we have different chapters for wine to water around the country. Um, whether they're professional chapters like Chicago or Nashville or Tampa Bay or different cities around, but we also have university chapters, Texas A&M, Florida State, uh, Hartwood College up here in, in, in New York. Uh, and so if that's something that any of you guys are interested in, I'm going to be hanging around for a little while later. We'd love for you to talk, uh, uh, talk to me about that, and we'll get your information if you'd like to look at starting a, a wine to water chapter right here on campus. So. Where am I going next? That's a great question. Well, I'll probably be, I go to D Dominican a lot. I'm there like every other month. That's kind of like my pet project. Um, I have three kids now. I have a nine-year-old, a seven-year-old, both boys, and I have a little three-year-old, little girl who I'm completely smitten with. Um, so I'm trying to not travel so far around the world so often. So I, I focus a lot on Dominican and Haiti, um, but we just really began doing a lot of work in Cuba. We had our very first program in Cuba about a month ago. Um, and so I'm looking forward to, I'll probably be down there the first of the year to begin working with our operations in Cuba. And then we have a really exciting program. Uh, we have our Nepal programs that are going on there. Nepal is just blowing up. It's one of our best programs. But there in neighboring India, we ha may have an opportunity to build a water filter factory in India that would service water filters for like that whole area of the world. So after Cuba, that'll probably be my next one. So probably Dominican, Cuba, India will probably be my next spots. So we wanted to present you with this plaque um, in recognition of everything that you're doing that we really appreciate. That, uh, Dr. Bear will read what it says. Oh, so if you want to read that. Doc, there's nothing ordinary about you. 
You are truly an extraordinary human being. Truly, 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 God's light and his love have shined through you and continue to shine through you. Um, we're very grateful for you to visit us and tell us your story, to invite us to participate with you. Doc Henley, in recognition of your selfless, compassionate, and humanitarian efforts to provide access to clean water to those in need across the globe, your calling exemplifies the mission of Waynesburg University connecting faith, learning, and serving. Through the power of community, wine to water transforms the world one drop at a time, and we thank you for that and offer you this in token. Thank you guys so much. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you.